you found the number one internet site for irreverent, cool, and entertaining talk programming. It's LA Talk Radio. We say what we want. Now, broadcasting from the city of angels. Los Angeles. You're listening to The Sheena Metal Experience with your host, Sheena Metal, only on LA Talk Radio. That's right, it's the Sheena Metal Experience right here on LA Talk Radio. For more info on the show, latalkradio.com, sheenamedalexperience.com. Don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show. And one of my favorite things coming up that I am doing in the next couple of months is moderating the Q&As for the Rise and Shine USA convention with the amazing cast of Queer as Folk. And it's kind of an interesting story how Queer as Folk just sort of fell into my life, uh, first through interviewing Scott Lowell and then um, through interviewing Gail Harold and then Scott bringing back most of the cast for a reunion in 2011, which then led to me having uh, Michelle Clooney on the show so many times and Scott Moore, show, Moore on the show. And then as this convention was coming up, I was fortunate enough to meet my next guest all this hour, who's returning to the show, who was a big part of the final season of Queer as Folk and who will also be at the Rise and Shine convention. The amazing Ryan Scott Green joins me again. Ryan, welcome back on the show. Thank you very much. Now, when people meet you, do they think, do I need to call you Ryan Scott? When because I'm sitting in like a casting office, everyone comes out and they're like, um, Ryan Scott Green. I'm like, just Ryan Green. That works. That's okay. fine. Because it's right, because thing. there are some people who would be like, you must call me Bradley Alexander. There are people who really want to be called by two names, and I'm not really sure what's up with that. I'm not that person. Okay. Well, that's good. I like that story about Excellent. you. Excellent. So, uh, it's welcome back. Thank you very much. It's now, great to be here. When you were here before, we knew the convention was happening. Yes, we did. But you didn't know I was going to be moderating. I, I knew I might be moderating, but it wasn't to the point of announcing it. So maybe you did know. I, I heard a, a rumor that there may have been a, a, a conversation being had. <laughs> I okay. didn't want to say anything. I didn't but want yeah, to mention and it. And I didn't want to either because it wasn't official and I don't like to announce things until I li- literally sent the um, the convention organizers an email, I think, before I had uh, the ho- a whole bunch of them in a couple of weeks ago and said, is it okay if I talk about it? And then they made the announcement on social networking before we we did the show. But it was like a couple of days before because I never like to talk about anything. I don't know about you as, a, as an actor. I never want to discuss anything till it's happening. No, exactly right. And And the reason being is that whether it's someone getting excited or you putting it out there, the right. level of excitement is never the same if you kind of leak it. It's always much better if you blow it up when it's official. And then right. there's no chance of anything going wrong. Well, and I think there are also some people in our business, and you know this, Ryan, that are a little passive aggressive. And by a little, I mean a lot. And they would do something sneaky, like let's say I go to the Rise and Shine USA organizers and I say, I really want to moderate the Q&As. And they say, well, Sheena, what a great idea. Let us think about it. Then I go on Twitter and say, hey, Queer as Folk fans, who wants me to do this? And then there's all this blow up. So they sort of have to use me, but they're not happy about it. And I see people in this business do that kind of uh, passive aggressive hooey all of the time and it's 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 sneaky it's a way to get something you want but it's not a way to have people like you it's it's backdoor publicity and it kind of it kind of gets you in the door and i mean you're right it does sort of force a hand um but it also if if they're not willing to feel forced it also creates a little bad blood right and and we nobody needs that and i also didn't want to be that one person who's like you know i know them because i know that they had a wonderful convention in germany last year and um, I I don't know, I, I saw wonderful pictures of the people who moderated and hosted, but I didn't know them. And I didn't want to make it seem like, but you know, if I did it, because that's just weird. Well, I don't ever want that, you know that weirdness? I don't know about you, but I get shy, I'm shy, and I get embarrassed very easy. I never want anyone to think that I'm that weirdo, m- L.A. maneuverer, you know? Well, it, but here's the thing. Because you feel weird about it, it makes it that much more genuine and valid. Because... Right. I mean, I think you're a perfect choice, and it's going to be you. amazing to have you there. And, and because, I really wanted to do it. Well, exactly. Well. <laughs> but, but I wanted them to want me. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and that's and that's valid, and that's a perfect. And but because you're there, and because you know the cast so well, right. and I mean, had I them all on the show, you. yes, it, it's just going to make it that much more of a, of a of a unique opportunity and experience for the people sitting in in right. In, in, I mean, in, now this is your second hour with me. I've done um, three hours with four hours with Gail. 
Um, I've done two hours with Peter, uh, 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 two hours with Randy, and I'm hoping that Randy will come and sit with me before the convention, either on the phone or in studio, and I will have just him again. And I hope to have just Peter again, too, depending on what his schedule's like for his new show, The Fosters. Right. And, um, uh, you know, Scott and and Michelle, I mean, I think Scott uh, have probably each done it like ten times. <laughs> So I, I know them pretty well. So it will be fun for me, and the reason I wanted to do it was because, I mean, I would do it for any sh- convention because it's I think it's important to be a good liaison between fans and, and cast and, and crew. But I also think it's fun for me because I think you're all so special. So it's extra fun for me because I like you all as people and I respect you all as actors. Well, I mean, we all appreciate that. And, and uh, I mean, in my own case, I won't speak for anybody else, but I definitely... Uh, think of myself as special sometimes, but we won't go there. Right. Um, but here's the thing, and and here's the Small best. Small little yellow bus <laughs> special. <laughs> Precisely. Um, it, here's the reason why it's such an amazing thing. And you're right. It, it is better to have that liaison, but it makes it so much more informal. And when you remove the formality, everybody has a better time. The guests, the the people sitting in the audience, uh, yourself, all of the people working trying to make this event incredible. Once it loses the uh, the formality, everybody's having a good time, and as soon as that looseness happens, it's magic. Thank you, and I and I hope that, and I also hope that I have because I do this every day on the air, and I I know about um you know sort of, and I deal with a lot of different people's fans from different projects through Twitter and through Facebook that I have a good gauge for how to make sure that the actors stay comfortable because. You know, fans are amazing, and sometimes they get a little overzealous because they're so excited. It's like how we all feel at Disneyland, and I totally get that, and I want them to be excited. But I went to a convention last summer for a show that a friend of mine was was on, and I took a friend of mine who is a magazine editor, and we went and we sat through some Q&As and and through some different things, through some of the nighttime events and a karaoke show and a band playing and some of the cool things. They had great things planned out. But I noticed that, and the fans were amazing, but I noticed that there were a lot of really crazy, like, you may not do this. You may stand up for two seconds. Do not ask them about this. Do not ask them about that in the rules. And and I, I understand why you have to do that, but wouldn't it be nice if you had a moderator who could kind of just feel that so it didn't have to be so sit down, no. And you know, there are ways to diffuse things. Exactly. And it, Without it being uncomfortable. It relieves the tension in the room for everybody. And everybody feels much more at ease and everybody feels like they can be themselves. And here's the thing. Fans, uh, panel, people who are working, if they're more at ease, everything is easier. Yeah. And that's and that's just simple you know, mechanics of, of, of humanity. If you are not stressed out about, I can't ask this and I, I shouldn't do that and I don't want to do that because you know, people may think I'm weird and... If everyone's thinking that in the audience, then we're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to have any fun. Right. I mean, we want to laugh. We want to. We want to have fun. I mean, we talked about this just before the show started. We're both super stoked about this convention. Oh yeah. And I'm based, super stoked about it. And, and based on the just what I see on Twitter on a daily basis, I mean, there's a countdown. I mean, people are literally counting down. Isn't that the exciting? Days. Yeah. I mean, people should send me a countdown every every day so I know where the countdown is so I can get that excited because I am totally excited. We'll put it on the website. Oh, I would love that. It'll be like like a like an advent a countdown calendar. clock. I have a friend who um, is uh, the programming director for a festival that's happening this weekend, a film festival. And when I went to the site, I had her on the show a couple of days ago. I noticed there's a countdown clock, like two yeah. days, this many hours. That's exciting. If I could have a chocolate every day to, leading up to the convention, that would remind me a lot of my childhood. Oh, remember yeah. the advent calendars? I love the advent calendars. Yeah. I was a fat child. I may just. I didn't even care what day it was. I just wanted the chocolate. <laughs> it's Christmas, damn it! My I'm getting a like, chocolate. It's only the second of December. Why is this thing emptied out? Look, I don't know. People celebrate birthday months. It, it <laughs> right. I think it's wonderful. I think it's. I think that fan conventions are one of the coolest things that has ever happened to to actors, to writers, to directors, to, to fans, to fans. And I think that film festivals and how popular they've become over the last ten years. And so many of them coming with a Q&A afterwards yeah. has just sort of fueled the idea of fan conventions. Yeah. And I think they're wonderful. And I think that um, if you're on a show and you get a chance to go to one, go. Absolutely. I, I have a friend who uh, was on, I, I don't know what season, and I couldn't tell you anything about the character, but he was involved with the Power Rangers franchise. Oh, wonderful. And he travels day in and day out 
on you know whatever convention and he loves it and he talks about the same thing that we're talking about the fans are great yeah the the the, the panel guests are great the people who are working everyone has fun and he says we've never had an issue yeah and I think it's basically because they put good people in place like in the place that you will be at you know June seventh eight and nine yeah isn't that, I'll tell you a really interesting kind of I love stories where I interview people. And then I interview somebody else who was talked about in that story, and then they tell me another story. So I'll give you one of those. My friend Rob Benedict, who's been on the show many, many times, I booked his band for years, he was on a very short-lived sci-fi show called Threshold that was actually amazing. It had an amazing cast, Peter Dinklage, and uh, and Brent Spiner was on it from Star Trek Next Generation. Right. And he told me on the air that Brent told him, Brent said to him once when they were doing that, because Rob was like, what's the deal with fan conventions? And Brent said, any time that you really want to know if the work you've done was important to people, go to a convention and you'll know. So then about a year later, I interviewed Brent and he told me that he was one of the last ones from the Next Generation cast that was really wanting to go to the conventions. He didn't understand what they were. He didn't understand why. And that Patrick Stewart had said to him, you have to go. It's pure love. And I always think about that now. Every time I see somebody's going to a convention or I see pictures on somebody's Facebook page, I think about Patrick Stewart, who I think we look to for acting wisdom, saying that it's pure love and thinking what an amazing way to frame it up. Because yep. there's so many things you could say about it. They're like, hey, it's crowded, or I had to stand up the whole... But just the fact that what he got out of it was the love from fans. Yeah. I will always think of him differently from now on. I think of him as like an amazing actor's guru spirit for saying that. Well, I, I feel like I thought, I mean, I feel that way about him anyway. I mean, just oh, just, lis- just I, listening I, I, to him talk right. and you almost Seriously. feel that way about him. Yes, but, you I can mean, read me the back of a Kotex <laughs> box and it would be like Shakespeare. <laughs> it would be really good. I, I, I'm not sure if I'd appreciate the box the same, maybe a cereal box, the Rice Krispies or Fruit Loops or something. But you said two things. It is pure love, and that's what fandom is. And I think we talked about this the first time I was in, and it's just the the, the sheer excitement that the fans of, of whatever right. the, the product is. And it is the excitement that these people... Like, it is the importance of the work that you do. And, you know, whether the show or the movie or the whatever the project is didn't land, didn't resonate with 100% of the, the, the world population... It doesn't matter. No. It really never matters. It, it's, it's it doesn't matter because it resonates with those particular people. Um, one of my guests who, who I has just started on my show, she's relatively new. One of my regular guests, Allison Arngram, was on Little House on the Prairie. She, of course, was Nellie Olson, Naughty Nellie. And um, she always is networking a million people to me. I call her the gateway guest because she's always bringing me more guests. And she's a very good influence when it comes to guests. So she suggested that um, one of her friends who played Miss Beetle on uh, the school teacher on The Little House in the Prairie, Charlotte Stewart, was in town. And it was the same week that I was directing the vagina monologues. And she said, you know, why don't you ask Stuart, Charlotte to be in the cast and get Charlotte Stewart on your show? So Charlotte came on. And unbeknownst to me, at the same time that Charlotte was uh, on Little House on the Prairie, she was also the mom in Eraserhead and then later went on to be on Twin Peaks. So she goes to all of these Little House on the Prairie conventions, and they have them in the Midwest, and they are hardcore. Those people come, they call them bonnet heads, and they come and they are into it. But she also goes to Seattle and goes to the Twin Peaks convention. Now, you think about a show like Twin Peaks that I think was amazing, one of my favorites. But, you know, 25 years ago, and for a season and a half, and they're still having conventions because something about that show spoke to that group of people, and the actors are still going and appearing. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. I think that it's, to me as an actor, all you can hope is that your work will live forever. Yes. As any kind of performer, even here with the radio or musicians with songs, you hope that in 10 years somebody will look at what you've got and think, oh, I'd like to download that and take a look at it. Consider it relevant. So the fact that that now, um, you know, many years after Queer as Folk has ended, these wonderful fans, some of which in the world are just now getting it or Mm -hmm. just now being turned on to it, want to come out and meet all of you. I think it's magic. It, It... it's ma- the magic of art. Some of it is a little hard to explain. Some of it is a little hard to wrap the head around. But the the, the sheer the the basis of it is is that fans live the lives that the actors tried to create, and when it works, it works magically. And the conventions of again whatever right. the project might be are just proof and testament to that all. But how many of your fans are are straight girls? A lot. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, a lot. A, a lot. 
I'll a say great a lot. Deal. I'm not going to name names because I don't know, but I <laughs> a lot. And isn't that wonderful that here was a show that for many years, you know, it would, a show like this wouldn't have happened because it was gay community themed and because there were very direct and honest love stories between men and men and women and women and men and women. And now it has this huge sort of straight population that has pushed it along and just opened up the world to acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful because I think if a show is only appealing to its own community, then it's preaching to the choir. Yeah. But when people who are not a part of that community are still saying this is a wonderful show. Yep. That's when it really is is important because it's turning the all over the world and in places where it's not as accepted to be gay as it is here, um, and parts of our country where it's not as accepted as it is here in L.A. are turning the world onto onto the acceptance of hey, people are people, love is love. This story with these two guys is no different than this story with this man and this woman, and it's all the same. And I think as human beings, all we can hope for is is for one day that there's complete human equality. Exactly. Absolutely. And it doesn't hurt that the acting is amazing. Um, you know, the power behind the words. I mean, I probably one of the best written shows I've ever been on. Um, it, it just, everything was so solid. Right. And, and you can't help but draw in fans of the medium at the same time as fans of the show. I mean, right. sure, Queer as Folk has, you know, the, the QAF family. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll refer to it as that. But I it, love that, QAF family. QAF yeah. family, one F or two Fs. Proud so, to whatever be a part you, of that. Exactly. But it, it, with such talented actors, and, you know, granted, great-looking actors. and sure. and But well-acted. The music was great. The the writing yeah. was fantastic. The, Soundtrack, the, the, beautiful. The, the, the technical, like, the technical mm -hmm. uh, uh, attributes were... It was an amazingly produced show, yeah. and you you were gonna draw in fans of TV. Yeah, and, and it was before it was really a pioneer. I mean, obviously, it was a pioneer with its content, right. but it was also a pioneer in the way that it was soundtracked. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think about that all that much until Gail Hild was here with me two weeks ago, and he was talking about how the music and how you know he got turned on to new kinds of music from the soundtrack for the show, and I hadn't really thought about it. I guess because I've lived in L.A. for so much of my life that I just assumed that gay men equals amazing music. But <laughs> um, but it's true. I mean, for a show to be that soundtracked, uh, and now all shows are, but yep. they weren't in in 2000. 2000, is that when the show started? 2001? The, yeah. Uh, 2001. Two th yeah, 2000, 2001. The, the, the final episode was middle of 2005. Right. So for a show to have been that heavily soundtracked during the, the beginning of the aughts, it, you know, now you expect every single show is is beautifully soundtracked. Well, if you don't have good music, the show almost starts to fall back. Right. Um. It it literally it's almost taken over. Right. And it's always hard to forget, almost right, when we were little, and it was just like that generic free music or there, whatever there the was score a, was. Yeah. There was somebody a, would be in their radio listening to a record, and I'm sure I'm 400 years older than you, Ryan. And it was like this fakey like bop 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 music. It was yeah. so generic. It wasn't even a real song. Well, you had three guys in a, in a studio creating like little right. little fade in fade out right. music. And, and those and guys now have a dartboard with the Billboard Top 100 on it, and they throw darts at it like, oh, we used to get all the money. Yeah. But well, that's a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, another example, you just did an episode of Lost Girl, yes. which is amazing. It has a huge cult following, and you're going to wind up going to Lost Girl conventions, too. Um, but that, it's beautifully soundtracked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, an action show about fairies, but boy, they put some great music in. All of the sci-fi shows are beautifully soundtracked. Being Human, I think, is some of my favorite soundtracks. They do a great job. I mean, I, I do remember... Uh, one of the episodes, and I, I blanking on the actual episode, but I got three or four emails literally within an hour or two after one of the episodes aired. My friends asking me what was the song that they did the end credits to. Yeah. And I'm like, I I don't I don't know. People I, I'm, Shazam for your I, iPhone. I mean, and this is and but that's where it's gone. I mean, people have to put. I mean, you have to put good music in your show these days. I right. mean, it's really the 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 baseline now, but. The good shows, Lost Girl being one of them, a lot of the sci-fi shows, they're doing it, and they're doing it really well. And they're utilizing songs that matter, not only to to the, the technical aspects, but they matter to the show, and it, right. and it drives the show. Well, and you know, and Lost Girl is in many ways a very female-driven show. I mean, many of the main characters are female, mm -hmm. and they're great male characters too, but, but it's supposed to be about, like, Bo's story, and she's a female character, and I noticed they use music 
that mixes well with what she's doing. It's sometimes it's female fronted music. It's music that fits under her action. Whereas it used to be, no matter what it was about, I mean, it could be two girls sitting around, you know, discussing having a baby, and this heavy metal music would come in, and it would be like, rah, and it would have nothing to do with what the action was. It was just like, well, what song can we get cheap? And, hey, doesn't your brother front a heavy metal band? Will he give us his song about death? But now they're soundtracking TV the way we think of films being soundtracked, right. which is where the songs go perfectly underneath. And because sometimes you don't know the songs beforehand, sometimes they use songs that everybody knows, but because you don't know the songs beforehand, or what I love about being human is they do a lot of like covers of like 80s songs, and but in this new kind of emo acoustic coffeehouse way. So it seems like the songs were created for the show, which is what we used to think of movies having. Yeah. Well, it... If you look at how, and I'm in by no way, shape, or form a music industry expert, but I think I can say to some degree, if you look at how the music industry has changed over the last few years, with right. the internet the way that it is, you can get great music to fit the show, to fit the scene, to fit the character, probably quite cheaply. Have it produced. And maybe it's already recorded. I mean, we all remember, you know, I don't remember the name of the song, but, you know, Dawson's Creek. God, remember right. that. Right. You know, Soundtrack. I mean, it, it was yes. uh, the, 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 the theme song to Friends. I mean, it literally, yeah. these are the songs. I mean, they were huge hits. Um, but nowadays, I feel like you can go as a producer and say, look, um, this is the show. This is the vibe. There are hundreds, of, if not thousands, of DJs who can create I mean, music is not the same as it was. Sure. Is basically Absolutely. what I'm saying, You're and right. and and that must factor into how it affects film and TV as well. I agree. I agree. well, and, and and so many independent artists. I mean, I've worked in the indie music scene in LA for over 20 years. They all have an amazing CD. They're all amazingly talented, and they all now make their stuff ready to go for film and television yeah. because they know they could get that call, and it's all up on iTunes. And there, and nobody wants to really, with a few exceptions. I don't want to use the same songs that, you know, Vampire Diaries doesn't want to use what Lost Girl is using because those are the songs people know from that. Yeah. So they're looking for new stuff. Yeah. I've heard, I mean, I've, you know, I've got friends in bands and, and you know, they'll play you a song and, and I, I usually will say something if it, if it triggers, but I've heard it and I've said, that is a song that should be on the CW. That literally right. should be a love scene on the CW. And right. and sure enough, I mean, you remember the CW back in WB, we'll go back a few years. At the end of every episode, there was a five-minute little stint where they do tonight's episode you heard music from. Right. And, and they, now and they, it's too much. They can't do it anymore. Well, they can't. Exactly. But that was how new artists were. Yeah. I mean, you learned. There are artists now that are bigger and better than they were five years ago because for ten episodes of... Uh, One Tree Hill, their song got played every time so and so walked exactly. in the room, and it's exactly. like exactly, it's beautiful. It was created for that. I mean, maybe not for that purpose, but it, it ended up being. It's funny because a friend turned me on to Vampire Diaries, and I thought, why have I never watched this? I'll just try this, thinking I'd watch it once, not knowing it was about two guys from the Civil War, and then I was hooked, being a Civil War <laughs> nut. So, um, at one point, and then you know, I, I keep my phone out and I, I Shazam. Because I want to know what things are. Absolutely. And I went to Shazam the song that was really beautiful, and it kept coming up, no match. And I thought, because sometimes people are talking over the song, and I thought, well, so I was totally frustrated and completely freaked out because my ultimate technology and instant gratification wasn't happening. So I thought, well, I'll Google, like, you know, episode, season what, episode what, Vampire Diaries, song, blah, 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 and maybe somebody would have posted about it. Right. And I went, and somebody has made an entire database on one of the fan sites of every single song played in every single episode of the Vampire Diaries. Wow. And it's like 30 songs per episode times 20-something episodes times three seasons. I mean, there's there's 300 songs there. Wow. At least. I mean, there's 3,000 songs there. And I thought, oh, and there I went there, and they have them all listed in the in the time they were played in the episode, like what was first, what was second. And I'm like, oh, there it is. Wow. Love the so, internet. But, boy, you could go, you know, let me tell you, if I was 12 and had mom's credit card, <laughs> I would have been in trouble. She would have been, what's this $400 on iTunes? <laughs> because the, the the urge to go and download every single thing there. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you say 12. I mean, the Vampire Diaries, there, there, there may have been some 
32 and 42 year olds. No, no, now. but I mean, if but I was yeah, 12 no, absolutely. And, and did not have access to my own finances, mom would have screamed at me. Yeah. Because I would have, I would have gotten it all. Gotten it all. Because you know, when you're 12, you have no sense. <laughs> I want every song from, and all I kept thinking it's is, only a dollar. I bet there are people who have every single song from every episode of the Vampire Diaries, and they have like a volume, like a hard drive, that is just the soundtrack. And do you know what we call those people? Yeah. Fans. Amazing. And they show up at the conventions. <laughs> Yes! So Amazing! It, it, see, it all comes yeah. full circle. No, I didn't circle. mean that everybody who watches The Vampire Diaries is 12. No, no. Um, um, although sometimes when I watch The Vampire Diaries and then Supernatural and then Arrow, I think, am I 15? <laughs> and then I don't care. But um, but I do think that, you know, there was a time when you had nothing. Remember, I remember when I was a kid and you had nothing to do except research things you loved and find everyone, follow everything. And so, you know... I yeah. was an obsessive little twelve-year-old, and it wasn't so easy back the then. No, I mean I, you know, I same to I, you know, we, we somebody made the joke, and I know it's been said a million times, but do you remember when you pulled the cartridge out of the uh, out of the Atari and blew on it, and it, it fixed it? You yeah, know, that was that was how you fix things. Um, you know, you, you got dirty when you went outside. I mean those. But we didn't. I didn't have the internet. I mean, I didn't grow up with Google. Right. I didn't. So to find out this stuff, it was really a a, a struggle, and 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 it really made you, strengthened your 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 fandom, if I if I can use the word. You became that much more uh, strongly bonded to what it was that you cared about, and I feel like it actually uh, it made you. I don't want to say made you care about less. But you really cared about the things that you cared about as a kid, because yes. it really took a lot out of you to to get into it fully. Whether it was, you know, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, or 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 you know, Barbie dolls, or whatever the case may be, yeah. it took a lot to get all of that information. Yeah, right. And but now there's so much more. Kids must have like their minds must just be exploding. <laughs> because there all wasn't that much to place. be into then. You could pretty much memorize almost all the shows on three networks. Boys, boys, boys shows and girls shows. I mean, you know, there was there was a couple hours for each on the cartoon stations, which you know I don't think Cartoon Network existed back. No. I mean that you had to go to your regular stations to find GI Joe or or whatever. I'm giving away all my cartoons. So now was I'm, it the same thing in Canada? Did you have as many channels as we had here? Well, you, I mean, you could. Um, you know, it was kind of the same deal. You either paid for your TV or you didn't. Um, but no, I think there was some limitations. Um, see the thing in in Canada, and and I, you know I I'm potentially speaking without knowing here because I'm going back a few years and I didn't study the the Canadian content code. Um, but TV had to have a certain amount of Canadian content involved. Oh wow! But I like uh, that. Oh, it's great. I mean, the CBC um, Canadian Broadcasting Company they they promote from within. I mean, you, right. Canadian content. Uh, you they know, didn't I'm know sh- that one day all of their actors would be all of our character actors and everything. They thought they had to protect the Canadian. Well, it's so funny art because scene. it's. I wonder now how they categorize Canadian content because you know they're right. the American shows with Canadian actors. I mean, I I could. But go a and Canadian find. crew though. Yeah. Well, you know, one of my regular guests is the um uh, the creator of Haven. Right. And he taught. I know we talked about this when you were here last time, but he uses like, I mean, except for the people that are his people that he brings everywhere. He uses a lot of Canadian crew, and he uses as many Canadian actors as he can yeah. because he likes the idea that there's more of a suspension of disbelief if you don't recognize the faces. Absolutely. If you're not like, wait a minute, that's a, that's that of that's the guy from Law and Order. He likes these fresh faces, and although they may be very common in Canada, they're people we don't see a lot here. Right. Well, and you raise a good point because, I mean, the first thing most people will talk about when they talk about using Canadian crew and Canadian actors um, is the tax breaks. I mean. Canadian governments, whether provincial or, go- or federal, they'll give you a tax break or they'll give you bonuses on your on your production, and and that's, right. that's certainly we one way. All, we should do that in California. Hello, California. Well, it's an yeah. incredible thing, but what I like about what you said is there's more to it. There's there's an actual art to the usage of the Canadian, um, at least in terms of what you're seeing on camera. It's a face that you don't recognize. Yeah. And 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 I like that. And I, look, I've said we've all said um, of a blockbuster film. Great movie. It would have been great not to see so and so in it. Um, oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like I, there, there. I mean, and I don't want to knock any, and I won't even name names. But there right, have been neither. plenty of Kevin Costner's Robin Hood. Sure, a, and a great film. But wouldn't it have been even more intense and intriguing if it wasn't Kevin Costner? Wouldn't it have been neat if he could have just had a dialect coach who taught him how to do a great English accent? You know, well, Christian okay. Slater had a great English accent. Yes, absolutely. And he's not, uh, you know. 
Lawrence Olivier. <laughs> uh, Tom Cruise, I just said Tom Cruise out loud, both names. Tom Cruise, his Irish accent in Far and Away oh, okay. was perfect. Yeah. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. So there's no excuse, just because you're a big blockbuster hero, you should be able to get your stuff right. Exactly. And there's no reason why. I know it's difficult, but it's it's part of being an actor. Well, it is, and 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 I can only think of the lineup behind Kevin Costner, a very talented. And I look, I don't need to knock Kevin Costner. No, it's and not he's my a job. wonderful actor. Absolutely. And in many things, he's terrific. Ex- Dances with Wolves, amazing. Incredible. Um, but the, on that film, the lineup of actors, talented actors, right. that could have been used, that had impeccable Irish accents. Wouldn't have right. affected or the film nice at accent. all. Yeah, you know, it wouldn't have affected the film at all. And, right. and sometimes I think just that, you know, going back to the point, the 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 ability to not know who you're watching. Right. Just the 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 intensity and the um, the int- the intriguing behind a face you don't see on a day to day basis. Yeah. Um, it's something great that happens in Canada all the time. I mean, there's very little. I mean, I, there's a very small, if not non-existent star system in, in Canada. Right. Meaning to say that, you know, we don't have a, a Brad Pitt and a Tom Cruise and a, you know, and a Angelina Jolie. We just don't, we don't treat our actors the same way. Well, it's but like, it's like Britain. They don't either. It's it's really yes. not important. I mean, we right. have actors, um, a friend of mine, Yannick Besson, he, he's a very well recognized actor and a lot of people know his name, but it doesn't go much further than that. You know, right. he works and he, you know, he puts right. his pants on one leg at a time and he does his thing. Right. And, and I hear the same thing from people in, in, that go to England. Oh, I was in a coffee house and just like Emma Thompson came and sat down next to me. Yeah. It's this whole kind of, because it's not that sort of like, I must stay secluded in my home. Exactly. Although there are some actors, and I have learned this from having guests here, there are some actors where I don't blame them for staying in their homes. Because we do tend to chase people down the street in this Country. Well, I mean, yes. I think in Canada and in and in um, uh, England, there's more of a like, and in Australia, there's more of a like. Oh, we'll just leave him alone. Oh yeah, I saw, I saw that bloke in a in a restaurant, and I just waved at him on the way by, but I right. didn't like stop and get twenty of my friends and. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I find it weird where the lines get drawn because I, there are Canadians, and I, I'm not trying to knock people from. There are Canadians who would chase down an American actor. Right. Um, there are Canadians who would chase down a Canadian actor. I mean, it, it exists. Um, I just, I'm trying to, it's weird where the extremes lie. Um, right. It's you know, interesting. Yeah. Because there aren't a lot of Canadian actors that people would chase down, and there aren't a lot of Canadians that would do it. It's really not an issue. Um, obviously, the numbers grow when you when you come south of the border. Um, for whatever reason, probably because we create it, whether it's Us Magazine and, and you it's know, us. all of yeah. it. It's, it's us. Our, it's, so it's the fame that we create around actors. Yeah. Um, and it's a shame. And it's a shame for them, too. I mean, in some ways it's terrific, but in some ways it's a shame because I think that, okay, let's, let's take Tom Cruise as an example. Um, I think that, that he has done some work that is amazing. Absolutely. I think he was amazing in Far and Away, amazing in Born on the Fourth of July, um, amazing in Tropic Thunder as that horrible movie producer. Yep. I love when you get to see him in smaller things, and 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 I think he's great in the blockbustery, few good men kind of things too. Mm-hmm. But I think that had we not blown him up to this twenty million dollar man status, that as an actor he would feel more comfortable taking a smaller part in something if he loved the part. Mm-hmm. I think we put so much pressure on our A-listers, and I'm making finger quotes, people. That they only can do this and they only can do that. And it's like, well, what the what the hell's wrong with Tom Cruise? Why is he in a movie where he has ten lines? Right. But as an actor, and I think British actors, you'll see somebody like uh, Gary Oldman. Mm-hmm. And in one movie, he'll be the lead. And in the next movie, he'll be in one scene. Yeah. Because he loves the part. So I think that sometimes the A-list status hurts people because then we put pressure on them and the agents and the managers and everything to not take a smaller role as an actor that they just love. Yep. Actors should do things that they love. Absolutely. And some do, like Bruce Willis. He'll go do an indie movie. He does it anyhow. Yeah. But not all actors feel comfortable with it. It's, and I think it's a shame because I think as an actor, your instinct is to want to play everything that, that sings to your heart. Yep. And I totally agree. I mean, I, I wish I could somehow add to what you just said, but it's it's exactly that. And I, I don't know what the difference is. I don't know if it's an agent thing or just a character trait thing within each person. Um, but you're absolutely right, and there are people that will, and there are people that won't, and it's usually the people that won't that we find 
in those strange circumstances, like, ah, that's a weird story about that person. Huh. I wonder what's going on in their lives. Right. We automatically think something's wrong yeah. if somebody makes an acting choice. Yep. And and I when I saw the you know, the posters are all over LA for the new Tom Cruise movie, the sci fi thing, and it looks like a really great fun summer blockbuster when I look at it I can smell the popcorn cooking yes. and I'll probably go see it because it's a neat it looks like a neat concept but when I see the posters I think like oh like when is he going to do like another kind of born on the 4th of July sort of thing where they cover him up in a, as a character yep. and I think that's hard and I know we talked about this I think when you were here last time it's hard for people that are very good looking in our business sometimes because nobody ever wants to let them play the grungy weird bald character because we put so much pressure on them that they have to always look so beautiful and everything. Right. And 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 the other side of that is is we've gotten so categorized. Right. There are if we want grungy and charactery, well we'll go hire off this list. Right. Right. We'll hire uh, a Brit. We'll hire yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll hire a Canadian. We'll go hire a Canadian. Right. Right. We'll have to go to the East Coast yeah. to find them. Honey, call the Canadians <laughs> and see who's free. Call one of the three I grungy know, Canadians. I know one of know. those Canadians. We could call a Brit, but it's more to fly them out here. So let's just call a Canadian. <laughs> we need him quick. Send a car for we a need Canadian. Him quick. Um, but you're right. It, and it's, I mean, I, I go back, whenever Tom Cruise comes up, I can't help but bringing up um, uh, The Last Samurai, which, in my opinion, was a huge role for him and something that I could watch day in and day out. It, yeah, it, it wonderful. Just, I agree. You know, he, he, he really did what I think he used to do every time. Right. He, he nailed it out of the park, and he was on screen 99% of the time. Um, and, and that's the film I use as my kind of benchmark for Tom Cruise. Right. Um, it's just unfortunate that... I mean, Oblivion does. You're right. It's a it's a Saturday night blockbuster. Get the Oblivion, popcorn yeah, going. It looks amazing. Looks great. Um, but films like that are more about the spaceships than the people. Absolutely. I mean, they're more like a director-editor's medium absolutely. than they are. And I haven't seen it. And Morgan Freeman's in it. He's yep. amazing. Love him. I'm sure if it wasn't a good film, Morgan Freeman wouldn't have said yes. I, I agree. Because I, you I don't tend really to agree. see Morgan Freeman in bad films. Yep. But the, I guess the conversation we're having here is, would the film be as good... Less good, more good. I've heard my English. If it wasn't Tom Cruise. Right. If it was someone who is a little less known or right. unknown. Somebody from a CW show who we're just maybe seeing in a movie for the first time. Exactly. I mean, obviously, the the it wouldn't track as well. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't sure. have the draw. But if it's if it's effect driven. Right. And the acting is, because of it's effect-driven, if the acting is m- moderate to good, does it really require the the budget to cover so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? Right, exactly, right. Um, and I think that's an experiment in filmmaking. And are the studios ever going to do it? Who knows? Well, but Okay, I think a great example of that is, is the Transformers series. Mm-hmm. When Transformers started, Shia LaBeouf was not really a big name. Absolutely. I mean, sort of, had done stuff, but not a big name. So you have to ask yourself, now he's an enormous name, in part because of Transformers, but is Transformers 4 doing so much better than Transformers 1, or did people pretty much go to see the robots, and the robots are always in it? You know, I think probably Transformers, they have all done well, but I sincerely doubt that each time they do better and better. I think that the fact that that he was in it, or somebody like... um, John Turturro, who's you know like a PhD from Yale, right? An amazing actor, mm-hmm. and I don't blame him for doing. A, didn't the, and the last one had like Francis McDormand in it, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's they get good actors, and I'm sure it's a great paycheck for them. Mm-hmm. But I think people go to see Bumblebee and yeah, Optimus absolutely. Prime, absolutely. You and until I've seen a couple of them. Well, it's I, I look. I watched the Transformers <laughs> and, and I, as a and kid. I love them absolutely. And I love the fact that they're the good aliens here to save us, and they turn to rad cars. We all like that. That's cool. But I think you're right. I think that you could use any actor from anything in those roles. And I'm not trying. I mean, let's. We're not going to pull anything no. from Shia. But I mean, no, it, he's, he's wonderful. He, absolutely. Um, I, kind of a, a similar situation. I just saw a poster for Hangover Three. Oh. Now, I loved the first Hangover movie. Right, I did too. And I went to w- watch the second sure, Hangover movie. Sure, and I did too. And I laughed and I giggled and I found a lot of the antics funny. And I did too. But at the end of it, I all I could simply report back was it was the same film, just with different scenery. I mean, the, just in Asia. Yeah, the 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 jokes were pr- the the 
the plot, the script, right. it all developed the exact same, right. and, and and it you know it was kind of like a it's it's definitely an anthology series because every episode kind of it was worked almost out the same. sort of like um you know I think it's what we would akin now to the old Hollywood road pictures. Yes, basically the same movie every time. Yeah, but they were in a different place, mm-hmm. and you knew where they were going to be because it was Road to Morocco or Road to whatever. Yeah, and that's how you knew. But it was the same thing, pretty much the same story. Yeah. And it was just uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby being adorable. Yes. And people went because they knew what they were going to get. And I think people love The Hangover yes. because they knew what they were going to get. The entertainment value is high. The right. jokes are going to be great. The 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 right. the, the, the comedy. Actors are funny. The actors are funny. They're right. they're fun to watch. It's it's a good go see. It's it's worth the money. My question to the people who talked badly about Hangover Two. To the point where they actually said they didn't like it and it was right. a ripoff and right. they weren't happy that they went. Right. So here's my question. Yeah. How many of those people, given that The Hangover 3 is being sold as the end of the trilogy, like it's all right. going to get Why wrapped up now. Why do I not believe now. that? Yeah. Well, it, even if it is true, how many of the people who didn't like Hangover 2 are now forced, sucked in, have to go see the third one because it's so-called the end of the trilogy. They have to go see it. They, they, they couldn't call themselves film fans if they didn't go see it. Well, and my question, Ryan, for people who didn't like Hangover 2 was, what did you expect? Did you not exactly. know that it was called Hangover 2? Did you think it was going to be suddenly like Lincoln? Like, what did you, what did you think was going to happen in Hangover 2? And people are like, you know what? I saw the second one. It was the same damn thing, and it sucked. Um, okay, what, what part of... Yeah. It's what did you want? Two. What did they you have the, uh, you know, the monkey and the, and the the same uh, guy and the crazy Asian drug dealer. They're all on the poster. Don't yeah. you know they're all going to be being those same characters? They're back. They're back at it. And this time yeah. it's a little crazier than than before. It'd be like being upset because Porky's two was the same thing. Like what? Did you, You're right on the mo- exactly. You, yes, I did just exactly say Porky's right. on no, the radio. You know what? What did you think? It was going to be. It's going to be Mrs. Ballbricker and the, you know, the crazy guys trying to get trying laid. Trying to get laid. And those movies have always been those movies. And there's a great market for those movies. People play them at bachelor parties. People play them after the Super Bowl. You don't want to have to think. You turn on Hangover. Yeah. There's and I watch all those movies because I try to watch everything. And when I've got a day where I've got to do like a whole bunch of my social networking or emailing people back or whatever, I just let them run in the background while I work on my laptop. And I get to see them all. I get the gist. And then I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm glad I saw it. Yep. I never really want, like, my life back. I never want two hours of my life back. But maybe if I'd gone and sat in a theater, I would. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess you can have that that thought. But at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with laughing. There's nothing yeah. wrong with being entertained. And, look, if you didn't laugh, if you weren't entertained, like, I, I, I mean, I, again, I hate pointing fingers, but I went and saw um, Identity Thief. Okay. Now, uh, Jason Bateman and um, the girl right. from Bridesmaids, I right. love them both. Hysterical. Very talented. M- M- Hyster- Melinda, M- is it McCready? Is I, it? I believe you're right. Okay. I'm. Don't quote me on that. But I have I think, to look, I'll look her up now because right. I hate that we might have botched her name. She was the best thing about Bridesmaids. Absolutely. By the way, everybody raved about Bridesmaids. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it was that funny. I but I thought it. she was hysterical, yeah. and I would have watched a whole movie just about her. Exactly. And I think that's what my have Identity Thief might have been. And I mean, I thought all the actresses in Bridesmaids were great. Very funny actresses. Yes. I just, I didn't think, I guess people played it up as being so funny, and then I just didn't think it was that funny. So I, I, I oversold it in my mind. Yeah, and I, 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 I try not to listen to too many people um, before going into a film like that, because you never really know what you're going to get. Um, but Identity Thief, I didn't laugh. I wasn't entertained. And, and that is my example. Uh, Hangover 2, yes, I walked out saying, same film. But I still laughed. I still enjoyed it. I'm still going to go see Hangover 3. because right. I, And that's that's my thing. If you can laugh and enjoy and, and you know, basically be okay with the 12 to $17, whatever a movie ticket is costing people these days. Melissa McCarthy. Boy, we sure screwed Melissa name, McCarthy. Yeah. McCarthy. All mix are the same to me. That's I knew it was a family name. I just didn't know <laughs> just didn't know which one it we was. We got it right. We got it right now. That's what computers are. Now I said for. Porky's and Mick in the same show. We're going to take a quick break. After that, we have to take a break. Then we're going to come back, and I'm going to ask you a, a question from a, a Queer's Folk fan, Ryan, that is winning some tickets to the Rise and Shine USA convention oh, because um, I'm asking you this question. It's the Sheena Metal Experience, LA Talk Radio. Quick break, and we're right back with you with much more radio fun right after this. <laughs> It's the Sheena Metal Experience right here in L.A. Talk Radio. For more info on the show, latalkradio.com, sheenametalexperience.com. 
Don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show. The wonderful Ryan Scott Green joins me all this hour. He is, of course, for many things, including the amazing Queries Folk, and he just did an upcoming episode of Lost Girl, such a terrific show on sci-fi. Ryan, welcome back to the show. And we got all actory, didn't we? We did. We went. We went really deep into the we, acting. We, well, that was fun. We could have went deeper, I think, but I'm I'm happy with how deep we we ended up. So let's talk for a minute about Queerest Folk. I, I know I wanted to ask you this: who who of the people that we know and love from the show did you have scenes with in the final season when you did your it was six or seven episodes? It it literally boiled down to just Gail. Your scenes were just with Gail. Unless we were in um, the Babylon set or okay. the, the Woody's set, um, you know, in a, in a bar scene where some of the other characters may have right. been walking Scott around. Scott was there and, and you Peter You know, there was a couple Powell. of years. Yeah. Sure. Um, but in terms of dialogue, conversation, a little one-on-one, all Gale. Wow. He's an amazing actor, though. Absolutely. Absolutely. He, he is an amazing actor, and I don't know if I've ever said this to him, but maybe I should next time he's here. And I don't even know if I've ever said this about him, so this may be the first time. But, I mean, obviously, he's he's beautiful, and we all love beautiful. We're humans. But even if he were not an attractive man, I think people would have still loved him as much as they do because he, first of all, is that good of an actor. And secondly, some actors have an ability to just sort of effuse this vulnerability at you. And even though he was playing this real tough character who was kind of an a-hole a lot of the time, there was such a softness and a gentleness coming out of him that I think comes from Gale. And um, some actors have an ability to let that part of them out in characters, even if it's a character that shouldn't even have that. Yeah. You still feel that. Yep. And I think that that's why um, he's he's been as popular on that show. It's just because he's such a great actor. It's a, it's, it's a huge part of it. I mean, I was... Oh, look, I got so lucky um, in, in a lot of ways with this show. And, and one of those ways being... You know, with the fact that I got to work with Gail as much as I did, right? Um, and and I knew, I knew, you know, from watching the show uh, prior to getting the job, and then getting the job, and kind of doing my research, and then being on the set. And but I remember watching um, during the final season after we'd wrapped, and and I, you know, gone on my way, and the episodes were airing. There was um, a scene where where um, he and Randy are on the the side of the road just talking. And they kind of separate in a, not an angry way, but it's a more melancholy, downtrodden scene. And the character Brian plays it very uh, snarky and kind of I don't care and okay, that's how it is, then fine, you know, no big deal, no skin off my back. And um, Randy's character turns and, and walks away, Justin. And they leave Brian on the sidewalk for... To me, it felt like two minutes. Uh, it wasn't. It probably was no more than 20 seconds. But they just left him there with his thoughts and his emotions and everything that was going on for him. And it blew my mind how much I knew about what he was going through. Yeah. He, you know, he 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 tried to hold it together. He got. Uh, to lack of a better word, sad, and then he tried to build himself back up, and then he realized how painful it really was, and he took, at least me, all through that in a matter of 20 seconds, and it didn't say a word, didn't have to. It just He just kept looking out at you know the, the path that uh, Justin had taken, and he gave us everything that was going through his brain, and, I, and, I, and it was at that point that I was like, that is, that's the talent. That's, you don't right. have to say a word. Yeah. Just an just an amazing actor. Yeah. Um. And and wonderful on Secret Circle. I mean, just wonderful on everything that he does. I'm I'm in such uh, such awe of his talent and and of actors that can do that. I think that he, not, he, not a lot of actors are amazing, but they can't do that. Yeah. It's what my mom used to call pathos. When I was young, my mom loved Liza Minnelli. She loved all these. There was a series where Liza Minnelli did a lot of these movies that were just depressing. And one, like an ex-boyfriend, threw acid on her face. Like there was, there. Was, my mom would watch those movies again and again. And I said to her once, like, why? I was real little, and I said, why do you watch these really sad movies again and again? And she said, because she has pathos. There's a when you when you watch her act, you feel like you're going through everything she went through. Right. And for my Irish mother, there was some joy in feeling <laughs> the depression <laughs> of Liza Minnelli's character as she walked around with the acid on her face. There was another one where like nobody liked her, and yeah. you know, <laughs> it was just fair, fair enough. Wow, they were all wrist letters. 
But there was something in the way that she had that vulnerability that, that appealed to my mom when I was little. And I've always thought about that. And even though, you know, I swore that wasn't going to happen, somehow I grew up loving actors that had that. Well, you can't, to use the, to use the very blunt phrase, you can't not. I mean, you to be so simply taken down an emotional road by someone on a screen, whether it be the big screen or the small screen, to be to be made to think about how you would feel or how you would react, um, just by the look on someone's face, it it it's empowering. It gives you the ability to feel the same thing. Right. Um, and when people can't do it, um, when it comes out cold or when it comes out. Um, Unchallenged, you 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 tend to stay dry on it as well. You 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 tend to be very cold about it and move on quickly. Uh, absolutely. Okay, so then here's here's the question that that is is winning a couple of tickets to the convention, which okay, I love. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so the question is, what was it like to play the villain between such an iconic couple? Which I think is such an interesting question because I don't know that I thought of him as a villain. Uh, well. Did you when no, you were playing him? No, um, I didn't. He wasn't. He wasn't a villain. Um, he did. See, okay, I'm gonna. I have to pull this apart a little bit. Um, I don't feel like I was between such a powerful couple. I had nothing to do with the the in in my opinion the relationship between Brian and Justin. And, and I agree. And and they were already broken up. Yes. For the most part, before yeah. your character appeared. Right. Now, there was the the element of there was a representation that I that I had that I think was a big part of the Brian character not wanting to to go the route of you know fully uh, monogamous and and you know be with Je- you know, Justin the whole time. Um, I represented kind of a threat to that. Uh, element of the lifestyle, and so you know, if 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 the Justin character was was hoping that one day this would happen and they would run off into the sunset and everything would be great, my my being there um, soured that a little bit, I think, um, possibly for the Brian character because I was representing his uh, demise in, in in a certain world. Um, so and maybe in that regard there was some 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 tension between the two. Um, but I didn't think of it as more uh, so much as a villain. I thought of it more of um, kind of a, a unwanted changing of the guard. Okay. Um, which happens. Which which does happen. I mean, you have to, for for better or worse, there are things that you know have to change. I mean, you to 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 remain the same forever is is I mean, you can't. Things are going to change around you and eventually things will have to, you know, they'll either fall apart or they'll they'll just change so much around you that you can't deal. Um and I think in in my final um in the final moment that uh, you end up seeing me after all was said and done with the editing and the production um episode 8, I'm going to take a guess of fifth season. Um Brian has 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 uh, kicked me out, 86 me from from Babylon, and and you know we have the the moment in in his apartment, and I end up back in the bar, and he sees me on the dance floor, and and uh, Scott's character Ted says, you know, I'll have him thrown out, and Brian stops him and says, you know what, don't bother, no matter what you do, you can. I forget his exact words, but you can close the windows, you can lock the doors, you can <laughs> right. you can bar the you can bar them from coming in, but no matter what, eventually. They will, they will come in. Right. And there's a little bit of a stare off and a standoff, and he, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm not going to speak for him, but there was this kind of understanding. Okay, this is, this is what's happening, and I'm going to, I'm going to roll with it and and grow as I as I as I need to. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. It's but fantastic. Totally answers the question. Now we have to take a quick break. Okay. Uh, why don't you give me all of your information? But there's a chance you're going to be with me after the break. Okay. I was like, you might, you might, you might get to stay for another hour with me. We're working on it. I love it. Uh, where can people find about you online, just in case that you leave and then you don't come back? Well, <laughs> if I'm missing when we come back from break, uh, first place, obviously my website, ryanscottgreen.com. Wonderful. Green, green is with an e on the end. Um, Twitter, I'm at Ryan Scott Green. Um, and uh, on my Facebook fan page, again, Ryan Scott Green. Wonderful. And the the Rise and Shine USA convention for the uh, cast of Queers folk. Absolutely, all over that. 
June of 7th through 9th. 7th, 8th, 9th. Absolutely. And I'll be there, and so will Ryan. I hope I'm going to see you after this. I do, too. We're, it's the Sheena Metal Experience on LA Talk Radio. We're going to take a quick break. I have a wonderful special guest, our regular Friday special guest. And then uh, may wind up being back here with Brian Scott Green or with another wonderful guest right after this. It's the Sheena Metal Experience right here on L.A. Talk Radio. For more info on the show, latalkradio.com, sheenametalexperience.com. Don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show. And as promised, the amazing Ryan Scott Green is back with me for more fun and we hope for another entire hour. At least you're going to hang with me until we figure out what happened to my 6 o'clock guest. Until someone drags me out of here. Yes. It's which... funny because when I booked you for this time, because um, I'm trying to do a Queer as Folk interview every week until Rise and Shine USA. Right. And I realized I had booked up this week and not done it. And then somebody dropped out during this time, and I thought, oh, i got to call Ryan fast. So I called, got you in, and the whole time I kept thinking, but I really want to do two hours with Ryan, but I can't this week. It's, it's been a good week. And now here you are. It's been a good week for me, and the, the best part about it right on our show today is that you're here for hopefully another hour with me, but at least you're here now with me. If, if somebody else shows up, I'm just going to go sit in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about Queer as Folk because we were doing that right before the end, and I'm excited to be doing this now. Um, and we talked a little bit about it, of course, when you were here with me before. Right. Um, did you? I mean, obviously, you knew the show was groundbreaking when you did it, and it had already be, been a groundbreaking hit before you got there. Mm-hmm. But did you really know that it was going to have these kind of legs? And even again, are you surprised? Are you surprised at all of the fan reaction for the convention just between February when you were here last and now? I'm not surprised by fans. I mean, I, I think you, you and I talked about that a little bit prior in the first hour and sure. then prior to the we actually coming on the air. I'm never really surprised by fans. So that part of it doesn't surprise me. But you said the word legs, and that completely floors me. Um, you know, I, I've I've always thought... Queer's Folk was a complete stroke of luck for me. Um, you know, someone uh, on my website, someone, I have a 20 questions thing, and someone asked me, they said, do you feel, I, I forget, uh, uh, Shannon in, in Illinois was saying, do you feel like playing a gay character um, affected your career, oh, yeah. you know, better or for worse? Sure. And, and, I, and my answer was very simple. It was, I never thought of it that way. It was whether or not playing the role of Brandon on Queer's Folk was going to be something I wanted to do. And we talked about Tom Cruise and doing something you love. Right. It all fell into my lap. Have, and you, I, have you since then? Because I know we talked about that when you were here before, but not this aspect of it. Have you since Queer's Folk felt like your career, any, at any time somebody's been like, no, we don't want him for Lost Girl because, you know, he played that gay guy. Never once. Yeah, I don't. I don't imagine there would be any. Never once. And 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 frankly, because the show was such a groundbreaking, envelope pushing, whatever term you want to use, um, and it had the it has the um, it, the acting was good, the talent was good, the right. writing was good. I mean, everything about the show was good. Sure, some people might not have enjoyed or appreciated or. Um, been able to follow the subject matter or whatever the case may be, whether, you know, for their own personal reasons. Sure. But from a TV and film standpoint, the show was great. And coming off the show, having the show on my resume has not, has been nothing but good. Oh, I bet. And the Showtime moniker. Yeah. You know, I, I worked for seven years on a CBS station here that had Howard Stern in the morning and Tom Likas in the afternoons. Right. And... Um, when I'm 85, people will stop me on the street if they know who I am, which they may not because I'll be wrinkly, and ask me, what was it like to work with Howard Stern? Do you know Tom Likas? Yeah. There are things that you do in your life that just stay behind your name as a performer forever. And I'm very proud of that. I, I love my time there. I'm proud to have been a part of that. I think what Howard and Tom were both groundbreaking for radio. Mother Love at one point was on that channel. Now she's here in the afternoons with us. Conway and Steckler were there. I mean, amazing people mm-hmm. that I learned a lot from. My program director, uh, Jack Silver, who had been the producer for Rick Dees in the morning, which was the first thing I remember when I first moved to California in 1980, was Rick Dees on the radio in the morning. Um, I learned so much there. But some things are so magic that no matter how much else you do, those things will still be behind your name. I mean, look at the things we threw out with Tom Cruise today. No matter what Tom Cruise does in the next 30 years, somebody will still be renting far and away Somebody will still be downloading Born on the Fourth of July. People will still know him from all of these yep, things. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, you, you mentioned Showtime, and then you know I suppose there are actors that do things differently, but for the most part, most of us have on our resume a list of the shows we've been on, 
uh, quite possibly the, someone who directed the episode sure. or the film. Right. And then the very next column is the production company. Okay. And uh, at least on on my current resume. And sure enough, right to the right of Queer's Folk is Showtime. Right. And it matters. It matters. It matters if it says Warner Brothers. It matters. I mean. It doesn't matter what it says, but what it says matters. And um, the, all three of those columns, is, is in terms of what the queer folk line, matter to me. Um, except for the director's role, because there were mo- you know multiple directors, right. and I have nobody's Did you name. just pick one? Oh, you don't have one. I, okay. I just put uh, uh, many people, or whatever, however I worded it. Um, Varied. Various, various directors. Um, but the Queers Folk and the Showtime, they, they're they important to me. Yeah, and, and they uh, should be. And I'm happy that they're there, and I always have been. And just this, just the last few months, I mean, and again, we talked about kind of leading up and how this all came about. Um, and, and I think it kind of developed off of Twitter to be honest Um, now I'm a part of this convention and again stroke of luck absolute I'm right. th- I'm going to be the luckiest person there I yeah, mean except uh, maybe me well uh, you and I will have to sit <laughs> in the corner the and be like what there. are we doing we're here we're still going to get early go there early and have breakfast yeah well I'm going to I'm not sure if I'm going to be sitting on the stage or in in the audience because I mean honestly yeah. I I you know I was a part of the show um, if we look at everyone who will be sitting on the stage and you kind of draw the pie chart, um, I'm the little sliver. And so I understand that. And I mean, it's, it's, but I think it's neat to have you because I think it's neat to have somebody who wasn't part of the whole thing from the beginning and part of the family that they became to talk about what it was like to come into Queer as Folk and just do half a season. It, you know what? It's, you know, I get those questions. I, I mean, it, Someone, I mean, I get a question a lot. What was it like? Because it was the fifth season. I mean, they'd been going strong for, for, I mean, in terms of seasons, four and a half years. Right. It's amazing how many times someone will ask me, what was it like walking into that family? Right. And, and that is and that is really the... And they really were a family. Oh, and they still are. Still are. And that's one of the things that I think I love the most about them, and I think that's what fans love about them. It, it makes that it that much easier to, to yeah. really feel comfortable around them. They really love each other. Like I've never, I've never been around them that they haven't been either talking about someplace they just were together, or they're leaving to go somewhere together. And they really, really are always happy to see each other, and they care about each other. And I, and then that's very, it's very lucky when you get that a whole other family from a TV show. Yep. And I have friends that have that have had that, and I, they're very lucky. Then I have friends that have been on shows where they're like, yeah, not so much. Yeah, not so much. I was a paycheck, and I love the work, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have coffee with those people. If right. you can have a family and make art and do something you're proud of. Well, I mean, I think in terms of, of this show, um, you know, what I do know of the other cast members and, and had, you know, had the chance to talk to a few of them over the course of the time that I was there, um, and from what I know social media-wise, all really good people. Yes, Wonderful people. So that's part of it. Um, the next thing is they went through – they're responsible for so much. I mean, again, let's remember this was a, again, using the terms, groundbreaking, envelope pushing, whatever you want to call sure. it. They went through that together. I mean, they were the ones. I mean, whether it was the people behind the camera or in front of the camera, yeah, they were, they were the responsible party. And I have to imagine that in the beginning it wasn't all e- easy. There had right. to, there had to be some 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 not so good times. Oh, and, and, and agents, every one of their agents telling them not to do it. But yep. now, by the time you came around to doing it, mm-hmm. the show was already a hit, so nobody told you that, right? I was getting thumbs up from everybody. Right, because um, it was like, oh yeah, it's controversial, but people love it, so it's okay to do it. Yeah, and it hadn't gone it hadn't gone like nuclear right. yet. Um, I, I think I mean it I was a, it was a huge hit, and right. but I think the the, the huge like. Where are these fans coming from? It's I happened in the last few years. I think it a bigger hit when it when it went outside of the states yep. and started airing all over the world, yep. where they where they needed that content so much more. Absolutely. You know, and I, I know I think I told you this the last time that you were here, but I know I've talked about this on the air. One of my very good friends is Stuart Milk, who founded the Harvey Milk Foundation. Right. And and as of the end of last year, I've been working with the foundation, and um, just to listen to what it's like for him to go to countries that really need help in that area that are not where we're at. I mean, we complain about Prop 8 and how we wish so it's why don't they, you know, legalize on a federal level gay marriage and blah 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 and blah blah blah, but our little puny problems compared to what 
people in the LGBTQ community are going through in Hungary or in Indonesia or in Afghanistan are, are just like they're nothing compared yeah. to to what where where he's actually going places and saving kids whose villages want to kill them. Yeah. I mean, really saving people from dying. Yeah. So um, I think queer is folk and shows like that, spreading the word and them being able to download the DVDs and people seeing it, it's, it changes the world because it spreads awareness. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it, it, for some reason, I couldn't help but think about this, and, and, and it kind of still rests with me, but it's very similar, um, and not to go to this, and we can come back. Um, there was a picture that showed up uh, a few days after the Boston Marathon bombings, and it was out of uh, Syria. And essentially, it was a group of Syrians with a banner saying, um, our condolences, you know, please be well in Boston, um, but please remember that what you're dealing with right now is a constant everyday occurrence right here. Right. Uh, and this is exactly what we're talking about. I mean, we, we, we have it. We we're not perfect. We don't, we haven't got it all figured out, um, but we're we're doing pretty good. When, Compl- when, yeah, when you look at it in terms of yeah. like if you the stay worldwide. away from the south and parts of the Midwest, you're usually in the eastern part of Washington, Oregon. You're usually okay. Yeah, and the middle of California. But you know, c- comparatively, I mean, even just friends of mine that that have that grew up in Israel, you know, here at LA Talk Radio, I I work for a wonderful family that is, is Israeli, and what it was like to grow up in a place where bombs are going off. And that's just sort of your daily occurrence, and it's yeah. because of prejudice and difference. And mm-hmm. you know, we grow up here, and we we don't think anything about our friends that are Jewish. We forget that there are places in the world where it's still hard to be Jewish. It's yep. still hard to be of Gypsy blood. It's still, I mean, look in the UK. It's no, oftentimes not a cakewalk to be Irish. Right. And certainly the way that the Irish were treated, especially in this country, but also those that immigrated to Canada and other places. Yep. It's not It's not always easy. So we've gone through a lot of the stuff in this country that those countries are still starting with. But I would imagine that for kids that, if you're growing up and you know that you're different mm-hmm. and you're pretty sure that you're gay, but you might not even know what it is because you don't know anybody else who is and you have nothing to identify with because there is nothing in media that speaks to you about being gay. And then somebody gives you a box set of Queer as Folk. I mean, that's it's life-changing. You you realize there's something out there that right. is okay. Cause, you're I mean, not crazy and you're not alone. Those are the first two great things. I'm not crazy and I'm not alone. Yeah, you, it's, it's okay that I'm... And you may, you may still never be able, not never, but at the present moment be able to define it. Sure. But knowing there's a difference and that differences are all right, we're good. But when you are kind of streamlined into the the, the norm and and you know there's a there's a misfire there, um, that creates, especially in young people, that creates a, a, a person. There's something that kind of triggers every day and it right. eventually starts to affect them. And unfortunately, I don't think as as kids, and this is going back to my psych you know, uh, education, they don't develop the same, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, when they came through their, you know, their, their late childhood and early adolescence and even their, their, their late teens, that stuff affects them on a daily basis. Absolutely. Um, there's a thing I call it gay puberty. I had a friend the other day that was like, what is the deal with so-and-so 30 years old and still posting pictures of go-go boys on Facebook. And I said, it's gay puberty. Because sort of like your gay puberty starts when you start to acknowledge it, come out at least to yourself. And sometimes it's, you know, you may have gone through a puberty at 11, but your gay puberty could be at 45. Yep. And I always tell people you have to cut him or her some slack because they're kind of re-coming into their own as who they really are. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like a reset or like people who sort of get born again. It's like that. Now, you know, 35 Christians are turning off their radios, but it's it's that same kind of thing. And, and a lot of times for a lot of kids who are, are gay and lesbian and trans and whatever in the community they are, they didn't even have, they never wanted to go to the prom. They never wanted to go on a date. So they didn't have any of that normal socialization and culturalization that we all had as kids. Yep. And and um, some did, some did, and then in their teens went, oh, and now I'm gay. But some of them, for some of the stream cases, they it was they were you know literally I guess so gay, and I'm using finger quotes, that they didn't even want to go do heterosexual things. So right. they didn't have that 
going on a date or, you know, writing notes and passing them back and forth in class with little hearts on them. And so they do it at 30. And, they, you know, it's better to, than to never do it. it blo- the blossom comes whenever it comes. The I blossom mean, comes when it's going to come. And everyone has their story. But this is, I mean, this is what we're talking about, whether it's, um, you know, here in, in, in America and we're dealing with it in certain aspects or if it's somewhere else in the world and, and, and things aren't as good. Right. Um, it's... It's basically, I mean, we're getting there, but it's basically the equality worldwide. Right. And, and you know, the day will come. Absolutely. Um, and I, and I kind of I hate, hope in our lifetime. And, well, I do I too. I plan to live to be really I, old, so I hopefully well, in our lifetime. If I'm really old and I see it, at least I'll know it happens. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't need to put on a cape at this point, but I think, and we were kind of how we started on this, the, the show yeah. was and is worldwide a big part of it. And, and it's it really, still changing it, people's lives. Absolutely. I mean, we talked about it the last time I was on. I mean, the the, the, the youth factor. I mean, I don't... Social media is, is, is good for everybody. I mean, you can use it to all sorts of things. Um, I feel like it is more of a younger person thing, but it doesn't have to be. But when I am playing around on Twitter and I spend some time and I start to get to know some of the people that are on there in in the in the QAF family sure. as as we talked about. I'm trying to, but boy, there's so many of them. I'm trying to get to know you all, but new ones are still surprising me. They pop up. I'm, I'm I meet one or two new ones yeah. every day. I, I try mean, to email f- everybody back at least once, but I I think if I go off Twitter for a couple of days, it gets out of control, and I I've, I've got to go back and find everybody again. Yeah, and they and they they stretch. They're they're the young, they're the old, they're they're old school fans. Absolutely, they're, they're brand new, and it's. it's and it's do they great email you? Um, I, I do have the email on the website that they can reach me at. Yeah, I, I and don't, me too. I don't get – the website was designed – well, at least part of the website was designed for people to contact me and ask me questions. And there is the sure. there is the 20 questions uh, page. And I've got a couple things you can respond to on the, on the website. Um, Twitter and Facebook tend to be where I get most of my communication. And that's fine. I mean, 140 characters, and and we have a conversation over two or three Twitters. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. It's it's great. And I mean, it's not like I'm having full-on conversations with people over Twitter, but I mean, I use my social media world is you know funny things that I think about and you know jokes that I come across, and every once in a while something poignant. I mean, I I spent some time with uh, again going back to the Boston Marathon thing just because it's right. a little. Was that hard for you? I was going to ask you that. Just, it, I mean, you're a marathoner, so that must have been a little terrifying. It. It really struck. I mean, yeah. I mean, it hit because I had I had people that I I know and, and love and, and friends that were there. Um, a lot of people. And you know, again, social media. Almost immediately, I knew everyone that I knew was okay. Wow. Um, but it changes our world. Yeah. I mean, it, and and not just our world in terms of how we look at things in terms of our safety and, 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 and terrorism and immigration and all the hot topics that are on now, but more so my world specifically, just because of the, the running and, and, you know, that element. I mean, the other thing that I do, uh, you know, on a day to day basis for, for part of my passion is I help produce races, five K's, 10 K's, half marathons. I, you know, I'm part of a production team that puts on some races around oh, wow. Southern California. Okay. Um, with a great company and a great little team, and, and we do good work, but our world changed for, I won't say ever because you never know, but the next year, every major race, every major group. That I was it, wondering about that. I mean, there's yeah. going to be have to, there's a whole new staffing procedure to yeah. races. And, and it's going to be more security. You're going to have to walk through the airport checklist thing. Course, and, courses will have to be monitored and yeah. scanned. Um, you and know. doesn't that take sort of the f- the fun and the and the freedom and the beauty of just running through a beautiful place? It, c- it can't be that anymore. Now it has to be. It's like you're going to have to be in the Pope Mobile. Well, I, I, it's a shame. I, I, I thought the same thing, and it it doesn't. And here's and here's why and and the best thing that I saw on Facebook and and we can get off this uh, no 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 I think this is beautiful we should talk about this it's important to you the the best thing that came out of um, memes and, and Facebook um, and I actually posted it a couple places uh, was basically just this you know kind of sepia toned sentence that said if you were trying to break the human spirit marathoners was the worst group to go after and right and it's we the runners every major city and and probably a lot of minor cities although I didn't hear of them run for Boston uh, groups of friends of mine literally two days later went out and just ran 26.2 miles uh, wow they just went out and did it um, down at Santa Monica Pier there was one in San Diego there's one in San Francisco New York had an amazing one good for them just the other day um, 
uh, a, a bar that I, I frequent every once in a while. They had a fundraiser on this past Sunday. Wonderful. Um, raised a bunch of money. It, the running community, it only made them stronger. I, I mean, wonderful. and that's and that's just it. And Boston next year will be, yes, it'll be heavily, heavily guarded, and yeah. every major marathon will. But it will it'll also be, be insane it'll, to get it's into. It's going to be the intense. Because it's gonna be everybody's going to want to do it. Yeah. And it's going to be a tearjerker. And it'll be, and yeah. Oh, it, it, it's going to yeah. be a total tearjerker. A year yeah. from now, when Boston Mar- when Patriot Day um, comes around, and you know the city of Boston shuts down, you're going to see, you're going to see some, some amazing memories, some some tearjerking. Uh, and on Patriot Day, that just sucks. Well, that's I they, mean, I guess they've that's called the it point. that forever. And uh, no, I love Patriot Day. Yeah, no, but I, I mean, do too. what a horrible time for that to happen. Well, they. They, you know, they chose their, they chose their battle, and, and they knew what they were doing. But you know, I am a northeasterner, and, and we have more tradition there. Like we, we love things, we plan things. You know, we, uh, we're very proud of the fact that the we're the seat of the country, that that's where the country started with us. Yep. Very, very proud of that. And yep. and they to kind of take that away makes me sad. Well, Boston, you know, they're they shut down. I mean, I, as far as I know, Boston is. On holiday alert, like their their most businesses are shut down. It's it's a wow. hol- it's a holiday Monday, at Boston Marathon Day in, yeah. in that city, and and you know for for actual for every good reason. I mean, it's the oldest marathon in the country. It's the most prestigious. I mean, whatever you want to call it, people flock to that marathon. Whether it's the the, the spectators, the the I mean, the Wellesley girls. Everybody goes on about the Wellesley girls, which I, I guess is mile 22 or so. It's basically just a bunch of sororities out there that are out kissing all the runners. Right. Uh, you know, good times. It's a huge event. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's, now, have it's, you run it before? I have not run Boston. Um, Might you run Boston next year because of well, this? Well, with or soon because of this. The the deal with Boston and this uh, kind of leads to why it is such a prestigious marathon. It is a uh, you have to qualify to get into Boston. Okay. Um, so it's a speed requirement only. Um, there are a few people who run it who have fundraised for a specific charity and have raised a certain amount, but for the most part, um, I, 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 I'm betting to say 95% of the people running it have qualified within their age group, having run a certain speed in another marathon. I'm just not that fast and. I think I could be. Um, I've just had so many other things that go on in my life on a day-to-day basis that training that much for a marathon um, to get to that speed, which is pretty darn fast, um, wasn't that important to me. Um, I'm okay taking a longer period of time to run the marathon and just having fun with it. It's wonderful. Enjoying the experience. Um, no, not no. to say that I won't run it someday. I, as I get older, my qualifying time will go up, right. and I may stay at the same speed, but um, it is important to me to to kind of subscribe to the the big marathons. Uh, New York City Marathon is a big one I'd love to run. Um, it's, it's, it's a bucket list thing, and one day I hope to do it. That's wonderful. Now, now w- when you run for APLA, do you, is that the AIDS run that you do? Or is it? Do you run and then and you run for APLA when you run? APLA, okay. So APLA has a kind of a division within them that is the uh, T2 uh, Team to End AIDS, and they are the marathon training program. They are a, a division of APLA. I mean, APLA, as you know, have uh, it's huge. It's huge. It's and got amazing. it's got massive components. Yes. And, and so T2 is, um, you know, it's. It's very similar to team and training okay. or, or end, end stroke or, you know, all of those things. And they have a, a, a staff. They have program reps and, and fundraising coaches and, and, and running coaches. And they bring people into a program. Um, myself currently am registered for the Xterra, Trail, Xterra National Trail Championships in Hawaii uh, at the end of November. So uh, I think it's July. We will start training for that race um, and we'll fundraise the whole time and all of our money that the that we raise obviously goes to APLA. It's wonderful. Yeah. And That's I'm, a big I'm, thing for you. I, I, it is a big thing for me. It was really um, at the time it was called the National AIDS Marathon Training Program and it's 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 altered and changed uh, a little bit and, and gotten much better over the years. Um, but that's where I started. That's where the running came from for me. Uh, in 2004 I was I hated running. I mean, it was really something I did just to make sure that I wasn't 
putting on too much weight or, or you know something to get out of the house and get a little fresh air. Somehow in 2004, when I ran my first marathon for APLA, something changed, and and since then I've uh, I've run four races, four marathons, and coached and site assisted uh, a couple others, um, and then this will be my fifth uh, fifth event at the end of the year. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's great. I, I enjoy raising the money, and and it's been great this year because of. You know, it's APLA. I mean, it's AIDS Project Los Angeles. So with the with the Queers Folk Convention coming up, and and you know, it, it's all just kind of falling into one great big nice ball. Okay, so when you now that you've done so much producing of events, mm-hmm. is it hard sometimes to take off the producer hat, Ryan, and just be a runner? No. Okay, because sometimes I think like for actors that produce. Right. Sometimes by the time you get on stage, the first time that I directed and produced the vagina monologues. I've done it many times as a as an actor. And the first time I did in 2011 as a director producer, I was worried about do the girls have enough food backstage? Is there enough wine? What's happening with the after party? Where are the pizzas? You know, where's the where's the catering? Really as I was walking on stage to do my monologue. And I noticed that it you know, it probably nobody noticed but me, but I felt that it hurt my performance a little bit. So this year when I did it, I made sure to get everything set, so I had some time while all the girls were in the dressing room chatting to go hide in a corner and just spend a little time with my monologue. It sounds so much more method than I ever have been as an actor, (laughs) but just to have a little quiet time to sort of put down my director and producer hat of answering a million questions, where's the bathroom, can my boyfriend get in, what are we doing, blah, 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 and just have a minute to kind of regroup as a performer. And I think the sort of zenness that comes over you as an actor is probably very similar to the same kind of zenness that comes over you as a runner. Well, I wish I knew. Uh, the, <laughs> the the couple times that I've you know put on uh, some sort of producer hat uh, in terms of film and TV acting, um, I was the same way, uh, and I never I have yet to figure out how to to separate the two. However, when it comes to the my my hat as a pro- producer of races um, in whatever aspect right. I'm doing it, or the runner of races, um, in in the production of races, I've learned a valuable lesson, and that is something is going to go wrong. Nothing will go perfect. I mean, everything can't go perfectly. Something's about to go wrong. And it, it might be there's not enough water. Right. Um, someone forgot to put an arrow down where they should. You know, it's right. something will go wrong, and it's fine. Just deal with it at the time. So when I'm on the course doing a run, I'm in my own head anyway. I mean, I've still got to get from start to finish. Right. Which, you know, regardless of how far I'm running or how fast I'm running, it's still a piece of work. I mean, I still have to actually physically do that. And I just leave everything else at the, you know, I'm going to cross the finish line. And, you know, maybe the timing company didn't put a battery in their timing mats, and I'm not going to get a finish time. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because tomorrow I'll run again. It's wonderful. You know, it it really is... It's kind of. But that's of, your zen right there. It's my free therapy. That's your zen. It's, you said you didn't know about your zen, but that's your zen. I that, mean, just like as an actor, your zen comes when you think, okay, now the play has started and I'm in it. Yes, and but no I haven't experienced it in that in that if form. If a yet. light falls off the ceiling and hits me on the head, um, I'm still where I need to be and I'm where I'm going to be for the next two hours. And there's a, a kind of a, for me, there's a a relaxing. It's like it's sort of one of those things like, and I I don't I can't believe I'm using this reference, but when you have surgery. And I've had many in my life. It's sort of this thing where you think, oh, my God, 20 days of the surgery. Oh, my God, 10 days of the surgery. Oh, my God, five days of the surgery. When it comes to the surgery day, suddenly this peace comes over you. And you walk into that pre-op room calmer than you've probably been in your whole life. Yeah. And you just lay down on a table and let somebody cut you open. And it is the zenest moment. You know, your sort of your subconscious takes over and just calms you down. Even your blood pressure lowers. All that like white coat blood pressure you get when you go to the doctor, you never get that before a surgery. Yeah. You barely even have a pulse. And and I think for me, it's relaxing and acting in that moment. When when it's when we're really right up on it, then everything goes away. And and even though the character may be doing amazing crazy things, it's the calmest I've ever been in those moments. I love that. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm sort of inside, half asleep, no. with my little nappy pillow and on, on my soft blankie, and it's nap time. It's. I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna try and incorporate a little bit of the running world, a little bit of that. Right. I mean, look. It. I look at it this way, and and maybe this is how I'm gonna do it from now on. But, you know, I, you sit in traffic, and you watch someone sit in their car, and and 
be so frustrated at traffic or their emails not going through or their cell phones not picking up their, their map or something like that. And then something tragic happens in the world. And you realize what is important and what is not important. And I think in terms of, you know, kind of what we're talking about, what is important and what isn't important and it's it's the it's the it's the acting. It's let's put all the stuff that we can't control aside and just deal with what we can control. Yeah. And it gets very simple. It gets real simple. And uh, you know, I it's one it's a skill. It's a skill, and if you can perfect it, I think uh, for some reason life gets a little easier. Because as a runner, I mean, if you spend every second you were running, Ryan, thinking. Oh my God, my breath's speeding up. Oh my God, this hurts. Oh my God, my foot hurts. Oh my God, my knee hurts. I mean, you would give up after 20 feet and you would not run. So there has to be a part of you as a runner that separates your physical body from your soul and heart and your and your conscious and unconscious will. Yep. So that even though your body is like, dude, we got to stop. Dude, we got to shut down. Dude, we got to stop this. Dude, we're never going to get water. We're going to die on this street. That sort of Zen part of you takes over and you just keep going. And I think when you watch runners cross the finish line, there's sort of sometimes this sort of elated, 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 holy crap, I'm going to die, and now I'm on the ground. As sort of the, the elation passes and your body kind of takes over, the only thing I can liken that to is when you do a play or you're on stage playing music and you're sick and it goes away when you're on and yeah. then you go backstage afterwards and you're like, that was so great and oh my God, I still have a fever I and still, I feel I like st- crap. Yeah, I still feel like... So well, it's, it's a, like a magic place where your soul kind of overpowers everything, even your body. Well, I hate to use this term because uh, non-runners ask me because they consider me a runner and I, 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 you know, everyone can be a runner. It's not you are or you aren't. It's a, simply a matter of just doing. Um, and... 10 miles is the same as 10 feet. It's, sure. It's, you know, we're all athletes if we choose to do. Um, but someone who, you know, considers themselves a non-runner will say, oh, blah, 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 runner's high. You know, what's that about? I mean, is it like, I mean, is it really high? I mean, is it like, and I get all sorts of crazy questions. And but we'll, there is, right? It's well, a- ex- it's exactly what we're talking about. And here is m- the best way that I can describe it. I hit that point when my brain is just off. Every, nothing matters. There's. I stop thinking about this. I stop thinking about right, that. And I stop right. thinking about. It's not so much this elation where I feel like I'm, you know, on top of the world and living the the great life. And I mean, maybe that's part of it. But it's essentially where everything is calm. There's but, but nothing else. That is elation, right? And maybe that's the Irish in me. But I, there's a point, Ryan, where you, the love of what you do and the connection to the whole, overpowers the little what my mom calls piddly poop, but she doesn't say poop, problems that sort of take over your life from a daily basis, like, you know, oh, God, I forgot to buy the cat food, or, oh, the gas bill's due in two days. None of that matters, and all that matters is that pure connection between you and the universe. Now, I'm no athlete, so I don't know about that, but I've listened to people talk about athletics, and I know what it's like with art. It's the same thing. You get past that point of... um that all that weird stuff that we bog ourselves down in every day. Right. And all that matters is that the connection to the whole and you are so locked into the universe and then you tap into that power and it's like you could do anything. Right. Like you could run 300 miles if you had to. Yep. And you have to remember not to overexert your body because you're going to pay for it later because we all are kind of stuck in a flesh sack. But you get to that, you know, like when you're doing a movie or a play and you can survive for like a month on three hours of sleep a night. Right. But, boy, it catches up to you afterwards. Yeah. But it's because your soul, it's like soul-powered. Your soul's powering everything. Everything's on full power. Yes. And, but here's, I guess here's the, the difference for me, and, and I'm not saying that all runners are like this, but when I talk about, the, I mean, we talk about the highs and the lows, and, and, you know, there's all sorts of sayings about the highs and lows, peaks and valleys. Uh, my dad always said if, if, there, if there were no lows, there'd be no highs. Right. Um, and, and depending on your philosophy in life, I mean, there's ways of looking at that. But... For me, I agree. The runner's high is the the point right in the middle where you're not low, but you're not super elated as well. You're just at peace. Yeah. And then when I finish, when I get to the end, that's when I spike. That's when I, I and I, literally the spike is 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 like a, a mathematical formula. How long was I at complete peace? Was I there for 20 minutes? Okay, great. Well, I'm this happy after the run. Was I out for a, like this past weekend? I went out for a what most people would call a very long run. And I got into the my zone 
very early just because I loved where I was running and it, it was a good few hours that I was at that baseline. Not elated, but not down. Just completely neutral. Wonderful. And when I finished, I realized I'd been in a very calm zone for the better part of three, three and a half hours. And two days later, I was still living off the 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 joy and the bliss of having been able to accomplish that much peace within myself. It's wonderful. And that that's my runner's high, is not being held back by things going on in my brain right. or not being pushed by things in my brain. because right. And people say, do you run with music? I don't. I, I, I probably run with music maybe 5% of the time. And it's simply because music causes me physically to do different things and it takes my mind places that I maybe do want it to go, but I'd rather not force my brain somewhere. This song reminds me of this person or this song reminds me of that day. Okay. Or, and so if it takes me on that route, over the course of a, a period of time, my brain's all over the place. And I haven't really concentrated right down to it on anything. So for me, it's about coming to a, a neutral yeah. baseline and, and living in that, in that space where there's really nothing going on except for clear. But isn't that sort of the same Zen place as when you play a character? Because the character is doing all the thinking and having all the memories. Absolutely. And you're sort of in the back, like the man behind the curtain. You're driving the ship, but you're almost blank. Yep. You're almost invisible. Yes. You're only like a, what do they call it? Like you're, uh, you know, the animators. You're like a 20%. You know, you're almost zero. You're just barely there. You're like a shadow. And you're still in there, but everything in your life is on hold. So you can let the story be told. Yep. And, and then when you come out of that, I mean, to me, you feel like it's it's like you've been in a day spa for five hours. A day spa. Like you just had the best massage, just went to the best therapist, just screamed in the closet till you couldn't think. And you, you have that relaxing, down. best sleep of your life, yep. best sex ever, and you're just in this totally mellow place because you've stepped back from it all. Yep. And let the character work it all out. Exactly right, and that's and that's precisely it. I, I guess the, the 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 term I always battle against is the the runner's high because for some reason people uh, relate it to, you know, this amazing emotion. This right. Incredible. To a and high like a like a caffeine high yeah, or a coke like, high. Like I'm I'm up on it. I, right. No. I prefer the very it, it's exactly what we're talking about. This yeah. very nice kind of it's exit the lock strategy. It's in that's the high. Yeah. The connecting to all and disconnecting from you. And then. Is a high. Seeing it on the backside. And it always makes me think, but then I don't do it, but it always makes me think, like, what would it be like to be that connected all the time and just let all of this go? And it makes me understand why people renounce all their possessions and seriously become Shaolin priests and disappear into the mountains of Tibet and never come back because to just spend your time always being so connected and so unworried about minutia. And then I go back into the world of minutia. But every time I do it, I've noticed as I've really realized what it was, and I think when we're young and we do it, we don't realize how important it is. Right. I hope when I come back, I'm a little more connected all the time and a little less concerned about minutia. Yep. Uh, I, we don't have to go there, but um, do you know the name Brad Warner? I don't. Okay, so Brad, we, we touched on it, so I'll go there for a minute or two. Brad Warner is an, uh, a lot of things. He's an author. Um, he's written a few books. Um he grew up in uh, Akron, Ohio, okay. uh, if I'm not mistaken. It was Ohio, uh, I'm guessing, on Akron. I think that's what uh, I read. Um, he was in a punk rock band, uh, several versions back in the day. He's worked for a Japanese animation company. Um, he also happens to be a, a Zen Buddhist ordained monk. Wow, nice. Um, Brad Warner writes an amazing book in terms of he brings the, the Zen... Uh, Buddhist kind of thought uh, path and process into modern day life. It's not a you know these are the these are the right these are the rules of Buddhism and and this is how you're supposed to live by them. This is how it affects everyday life. And he's very he's very well spoken and he kind of just brings it down to a level that people can really just relate to. Um, I've read a few of his books and we're kind of touching on a lot of the stuff that he talks about and. You know his big thing is well look if you can if you can worship you know this or that within this great big universe of ours it really would make more sense that you can worship this or that as well sure. uh, you know don't 
um, let's not put, and I, I'm not speaking about any anybody in particular, but let's not put this massive bird of, of great um, regality on, right. on, a, on a pedestal, but the dead bird on the side of the road, we just spit on and clean up. You know what I mean? It's, it's right. all equally uh, worth worship because it's all part of this amazing universe. And, right. And, and, and it's just, I mean, I, it's beautiful. I'm, not, I'm not trying to get... But that's locking into the hole. It's locking into the hole, exactly. And, and it's like, all an experience, and now we're running out of time, and I can't finish this thought completely, but even the things that are bad, you find a way to make them feel good. Well, they have... So that, because they're important. It was like your dad said, right? You don't, you don't notice the good unless you have the bad, and I believe that. Exactly. That's an old Irish philosophy. Yeah. It's an excuse for us to have a lot of bad and be okay with it. Uh, you are amazing, my friend. Will you come back again and again and again? <laughs> Uh, the next hour, right? Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> no, oh, somebody else's hour. Darn. Damn. Uh, but come back and see me again before the convention. I would love that. I promise. And uh, Or if not, right after the convention for a recap. And where is the best place that people can find out about everything you're doing online? The the Well, obviously, with the convention, the Rise and Shine USA convention, uh, uh, dot, dot com, obviously. Um, my Facebook page, Ryan Scott Green. Uh, my Twitter, at Ryan Scott Green. And my webpage, Ryan Scott Do it, people. Or SheenaMetalExperience.com, LATalkRadio.com. Uh, for, uh, send me an email. I'll forward links over to you. you can-